Hello, and um, welcome to the first of our fall uh, Your Child's Health University lectures tonight. I'm Felice Stonestrom, and I coordinate the community programs here at Packard Children's. And just as a reminder, we are videotaping the lecture tonight. Um, so we ask that you hold all of your questions until the end, at which point we'll turn off the cameras and then you can ask your questions anonymously. And the video will be on our, um, our video library on our website as well as in Stanford iTunes. So I also want to point out that on the back of your um, handout there is an evaluation and we'd really appreciate all of your feedback tonight before you leave. So it's my great pleasure to introduce um, our speaker tonight. Dr. Seth Ammerman is a clinical professor in the Department of Pediatrics, Division of Adolescent Medicine at Stanford University and Lucille Packard Children's Hospital. He is the medical director of the Teen Health Band, a mobile clinic program providing comprehensive primary health care services to homeless and uninsured youth ages 10 to 25. The program is a community outreach program of Lucille Packard Children's Hospital with major support from the Children's Health Fund and serves youth in San Francisco, San Mateo, and Santa Clara counties. Dr. Ammerman is chair of the Northern California chapter of the American Academy of Pediatrics Substance Abuse Committee and is a member of the National American Academy of Pediatrics Committee on Substance Abuse. He's a member of the Medical Honor Society, Alpha Omega Alpha, and is a fellow of the Society for Adolescent Health and Medicine. In 2012, Dr. Ammerman received a Silicon Valley Business Journal Health Care Heroes Award. He also received the Founders Award in 2012 for his work in community adolescent health from the American Academy of Pediatrics, the national organization of pediatricians in the US. Dr. Ammerman attended college at Tufts University, medical school at George Washington University, pediatric residency at University of Michigan, a public health service stint in the Rural Health Service in Price, Utah, and an Adolescent Medicine Fellowship at UCSF. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Ammerman as our speaker. Thanks a lot for that nice introduction and um, Thank you all for coming tonight. I'm going to speak for approximately 45 minutes and we'll then have questions uh, afterwards, as you heard. The title of my talk, as you know, and can see is Sex, Drugs, and Rock and Roll, What Parents Should Know. And here's the outline of my talk. I'm first going to talk about, give you an overview of behavior and developmental concerns on these various adolescent topics. I'll next get into a section on the statistics. This is intentional uh, because I think it's important that you have the, the information and data about these issues that we're discussing. I'm going to give a brief summary of adolescent development. I will then talk about parental approaches that are generally considered to be unhelpful in dealing with these issues, followed by parental approaches that are generally considered to be helpful in working with your adolescent. And finally, I'll give a brief summary and then some resources for you. You all should have a handout of my talk. And in particular, I won't spend a lot of time going through the resources. I'll just point them out, but they'll be there for later reference for you. So, starting with teen sex, why the concern about this? Well, many teens are sexually active. I'm going to get into the specific statistics on each of these topics in the next part of the talk. This is more general at this point. But why, why are we concerned about it? Well, there are many potential negative outcomes related to sexual activity among teens. And these include unintended pregnancy, sexually transmitted diseases, and importantly, psychosocial issues, such as emotional and behavior problems. So, uh, some teens may have sex but not really want to, may not enjoy it but may feel pressured that they should, and may have trouble establishing meaningful relationships that can uh, really impact 
sexual satisfaction in adult life. What about teen drug use? Many teens do experiment with tobacco, alcohol, and other drugs. There are many potential negative outcomes related to this as well, which can include addiction, abnormal brain development, poor performance in school and work, legal trouble, and motor vehicle accidents resulting in disability and death. Teen mental health, why, do, why the concern? Well, mental health problems are common and also have many potential negative outcomes, which can include poor school and work performance, legal trouble, drug use. This is often due to uh, self-medication, dealing with mental health issues, and suicidality. Eating disorders, another area of concern. Disordered eating is common in teenagers. The negative outcomes may include obesity, or on the other hand, development of full-blown eating disorders such as anorexia nervosa or bulimia nervosa. These can result in malnutrition with serious medical complications, including death, physiologic derangements, and chronic poor psychological functioning. Safety, another big issue for us. Injuries are the number one causes of disability and death in teens, and whether intentional or not. And these injuries result from risky behaviors that teens engage in, which may include not wearing a bicycle helmet, not wearing a seat belt, carrying a weapon, and more and more commonly texting or emailing while driving. The top three causes of death in teens are first, motor vehicle accidents, second, homicides, and third, suicides. I'm going to be giving you some statistics from the uh, number, a few different databases that are national in the United States. The Youth Risk Behavior Survey is, is done by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. And this is a national survey of high school students looking at a variety of risk behaviors. I'm just going to focus on, on some of these. And the data from 2011 are the latest data available. Starting off with sexual activity, the, num the percent of high school females who have ever had sex are almost 50%, 46%. Male rates are slightly higher at 49%. If you break it down by grade, a third of males and females are sexually active by ninth grade. The rates go up year to year. That would be unsurprising, really. But by 12th grade, two thirds um, of males and females have, have, have been sexually active. These are again high school data. So females who have had greater than four sex partners by the end of high school are one in eight. Males have higher rates again, almost one in five. And again, if you break it down by grade, almost one in 10 ninth graders have had four or more sex partners. And again, these rates go up by grade, unsurprisingly, till 12th grade, about one in four. And of course, this is a concern because the more sex partners an adolescent has, the more likely they are to acquire an STI, a sexually transmitted infection, as well as potentially an unintended pregnancy in terms of contraception use and Looking at condom use, it's not bad. Um, over half of females use condoms when asked about if they use during their last sexual activity. Males were actually better than females, using it two-thirds of the time. Interestingly, rates go down a little bit during high school. 
Uh, it seems that 10th graders are a little better about condom use than 11th or 12th graders. Switching now to substance use with sexual activity. The reason why this is important is because if a teen has sex under the influence, they're much less likely to use a condom or use contraception and be more at risk for unintended pregnancy or a sexually transmitted infection. It's also a proxy for potentially not enjoying their sexual activity because there are, there are good data to show that if you have sex under the influence as a teenager, you may not really be wanting to have sex and you're kind of numbing yourself during the experience and on drugs so you're not present. And almost one in five females and one in four males were under the influence of alcohol or drugs when they last had sex. Um, it's, it's common through all the, the grades of 10th, 11th, and 12th, but it goes up particularly in 12th grade that this is uh, an issue. Now, another issue, of course, is birth rates and un unintended pregnancy. So this is from the, these data are from the United States Department of Health and Human Services, which has, uh, I think it's a great thing, an Office of Adolescent Health, which focuses on adolescent issues. And this is also from 2011. And the teen birth rate actually in this country is the lowest it's ever been. Uh, we've made great strides in this area. So it's now down to 31 births per thousand female ages 15 to 19. And this is basically half of what it was a little over 20 years ago. One of the issues, though, is that almost one in five of these teen births are repeat births. So these are teenagers having their second child or more. And we generally know that adolescents who are um, teen moms in particular tend to have worse health outcomes uh, and worse socioeconomic status as well uh, as adults. So from a number of different levels, this can be problematic. In terms of ethnicity for teen birth rate, Hispanics have the highest and non-Hispanic whites the lowest, uh, with blacks or African Americans close to the Hispanic birth rate. They actually track the, the number of teen births between 15 to 19 year olds in the country, and the absolute number was over 300,000, as you can see. 90% of these pregnancies were unintended. And almost 90% were non-marital. That's an issue for teens because, again, their socioeconomic uh, and psychosocial outcomes tend to be much worse. Of these 300 plus thousand births, 82% were unplanned. Um, and Almost 60% ended up in live births with 14% in miscarriages and about one in four abortions. I would add that this is actually the lowest abortion rate among teens that's ever, that um, uh, has been recorded in quite some time, reflecting the, the lowering of the teen birth rate. What about contraception? Um, Condoms are the most commonly used method of contraception in teens, but hormonal contraceptives are used. And I would add that our message to teens is that all these methods essentially are safe and effective. One is not necessarily better than the other, but it's really what you think will work best for you. The current hormonal contraceptives are six which include the birth control pills. I would add that when birth control pills first came out in the 1960s, the dose of estrogen was approximately four to five times what it is currently. So that a lot of side effects that maybe some of you experienced or your mothers <laughs> experienced, uh, we don't see those same kind of side effects because the, the doses of estrogen are much lower. They started out at about 120 micrograms of estrogen per pill 
it's now much more common to be at most 35 micrograms. And they go down to 15 uh, per pill, and they're all equally effective in pregnancy prevention. I've listed these in order of how often they need to be utilized. There's the birth control patch, which is a weekly change. You wear the patch for a week and then change it out weekly. There's a vaginal ring that is inserted in the vagina and lasts for three weeks. You take it out after three weeks, you're still protected for a week, and then you put it back in for three weeks. So it's that four-week cycle. By the way, all these methods are prescription at this point in time. None of these are over the counter. The longer acting injection, referred to as Depo-Provera, is lasts for 12 weeks. This is easier for some teens because they just need to come to the clinic every 12 weeks to get their uh, injection. Implanon or Nexplanon is the next longest acting, which is this little rod that's put under the arm. And that lasts for three years. The longest acting is the intrauterine device, which depending upon the type of device can last five to 10 years. Now, why do teens use or not use contraceptives if they're sexually active? Well, often teens feel like they don't need them. Sex is something that's spontaneous and I, um, it's not, quote, expected and I don't want anything to interfere with it or I don't want to have to stop and put on a condom or um, I've got other things going on so I forget to take my pill or use my method. Or I've had sex without protection and nothing happened. So... Um, I don't need anything. As a matter of fact, I'm worried I might be infertile, and I actually get teen girls who come into the clinic worried about their fertility because they've had unprotected sex and not gotten pregnant. So it's a good opportunity for me to educate them about the menstrual cycle and, and fertile times and so on. Um, sex may be sporadic. So I may not be in the, they may not be in the habit of using a method when they do have sex. There are many myths out there, and there's lots of misinformation about the safety and side effects and effectiveness of contraceptives. So that's one thing we try to educate our adolescents about. Teens like things to be easy in this realm. And if it's, they don't feel like it's easy, they're not going to use it. Uh, not only s potential myths about side effects, but perceived side effects. I had a girl the other day who came in to, uh, for a follow-up visit after I put her on the birth control pill. She stopped taking it after s a few days. I asked her why. And by the way, I always tell my teens, please call. Don't stop. Call if you have questions or, or concerns first before stopping. Um, she didn't, which... <laughs> is also fairly typical, but a couple days after she started taking the pill, did she develop back pain? And in her mind, she started taking the pill and then she developed back pain, so they were related. She didn't want the back pain, so it made sense to stop the pill. Now, I, I can let you know back pain is not a side effect of the birth control pill, but it made perfect sense to her. So. These are the kinds of things that we need to uh, counsel our patients about, and that's why we see them frequently for follow-up. We're not concerned about major medical complications with contraception. They're safe, they're effective in adolescence, but it's this kind of thing. Or she broke up with her boyfriend and she stopped the method, but a new boyfriend appeared. <laughs> but she didn't restart it. Not unusual. Partner preference is very important. Teen girls uh, are influenced by their boyfriends. And what their boyfriend thinks and wants and prefers can often be huge in whether the adolescent will uh, 
adhere to a contraceptive method. So we always like as much as possible talking with the sexual partners as well. That's not always possible. Um, and girls are much better than boys about <laughs> dealing with reproductive health care issues uh, in general. But we, we do like that if possible. But we always do ask them about their partner, what their partner thinks, and so on. And best if the partner comes in. What about STDs? We use an interchangeable term, sexually transmitted diseases or sexually transmitted infections. It's gone more to sexually transmitted infections because disease was felt to be stigmatizing, but they're essentially uh, synonymous. This is again from the Youth Risk Behavior Survey from 2011. There are lots of STIs diagnosed annually in this country, 19 million was the last. And 50% are in your teen uh, young adult population. Chlamydia, gonorrhea, and HPV are the top three. The good news about chlamydia and gonorrhea is that they're treatable. If not treated in time, they can cause some serious chronic problems, including pelvic inflammatory disease and even infertility. HPV, which is a viral uh, disease and is a, uh, may cause genital warts or cervical cancer, uh, is not treatable. Um, I would say we, we have treatments for it. It's not curable. But interestingly, uh, many women clear the virus themselves from, from their body. Not all women, though. And you may know there's now a vaccine for HPV that we now recommend for all girls best before becoming sexually active and for all boys because it is a STI, boys transmit it to girls and vice versa. So there's now uh, a universal recommendation for all boys and girls to get the HPV vaccine. The, it's a very safe and effective vaccine. The bottom statistic is one that's of concern. A quarter of all sexually active adolescents will be diagnosed with an STI by high school graduation if current trends continue. Obviously, the hormonal contraceptives do not protect against STIs. Condoms do. To get an adolescent to use a condom and a hormonal contraceptive is more difficult than just using one or the other. Both are preferred. One is better than not. <laughs> um, but we certainly let our adolescent patients, our teen patients, know about this. Let's move to alcohol, which is the most commonly used drug among adolescents. I'm using adolescents and teens interchangeably here. Uh, I'll get a little more into the, the technical difference, but for all intents and purposes, uh, those terms are the same. Well, um, alcohol use is a problem among adolescents. Um, the most recent data, MTF stands for Monitoring the Future. Monitoring the Future is a national database that's sponsored by the University of Michigan. and the National Institute of Drug Abuse. And this database gathered its first data in 1975. So we almost have 40 years of data on trends in adolescent drug use. And it goes into tobacco, alcohol, and other drug use. One of the concerns that's come up more recently is what we call extreme binge drinking, uh, which is drinking 10 or more dr alcoholic drinks at, at one sitting, at least once in the past two weeks. One in 10 high school seniors had done this. And 5% had had 15 or more. Now, when you're this intoxicated, you're bound to do stupid stuff <laughs> or even um, end up in an emergency room or die from drinking this, from alcohol poisoning. 
In terms of uh, have you ever been drunk at least once in the past month, not many eighth graders, I'm talking 14 year olds, but one in eight 10th graders and over one in four 12th graders have been drunk in the past month. In terms of other drug use from 2012 monitoring the future data, if they were asked, have you used these drugs at least once in the past 30 days? And that's called current use. And why this is an important statistic is because current users are the ones more likely to go on to more frequent use, unless there's some kind of intervention. So you may start off at once in the past 30 days, but then you're going to twice, and then you're going to once a week, and then um, more often than that. So marijuana was about one in four current users of 12, uh, marijuana of 12th graders. Cigarettes were about, uh, 17, were 17%, smokeless tobacco a little less than one in 10, and prescription drugs were about 7%. I wanna go through each of these just a little bit. The marijuana rates have gone up. It's not surprising, I think, given the, the medical marijuana um, becoming uh, now legal. I think the latest are 18 states plus District of Columbia. There, of course, you may know that Colorado and Washington have legalized marijuana for adult use. Um, um, we don't really know what the impact of that will be because that just happened in terms of youth use rates. Whether, whether it will be up, down, or stay the same, we're not sure. But certainly, overall, marijuana use rates seem to be uh, going up in terms of current use. Cigarette use rates are going down overall. If you looked in the mid-1990s, the cigarette use rate was double this. It was in the mid-30%. So cigarette um, rates are going down. But interestingly, and I don't have a slide on this, electronic cigarette rates are going up among high school students, or e-cigarettes. You may have seen these advertised on TV. And um, interestingly, I read an article in the Wall Street Journal a few months ago where the, the major cigarette companies now believe that in 10 years, the most popular cigarette product will be e-cigarettes versus traditional cigarettes. Now, electronic cigarettes were first developed uh, in China, by the way, and most of the manufacturing is in China at the moment, which is a big problem in terms of quality control. And the chemicals that are in e-cigarettes uh, uh, and include things like antifreeze and, and, and other toxic chemicals. But the big tobacco companies are starting to buy up all these companies to make it um, as uh, their prime product, as I mentioned. They vaporize the nicotine. Um, and what that means is instead of burning the cigarette, which is a traditional cigarette, you light it, it burns. You inhale it. What's produced is, is smoke. Smoke contains tar and lots of toxic elements. To burn something is about 1,200 degrees Fahrenheit. Instead of burning it, you vaporize it. What that does is slowly heats up whatever it is you want the product from, so in this case, nicotine. You heat it up, I'll use some round numbers, to about 400 degrees. And all you produce, you don't produce any smoke. You produce water vapor. I would add, by the way, that vaporizers are, are now very commonly sold in medical marijuana dispensaries as a harm reduction item for those patients who smoke marijuana. So instead of smoking marijuana, because it doesn't matter what you smoke, you get tar. If you, if you burn something and you get smoke, you get tar and ke other chemicals. 
So as a harm reduction method in medical marijuana dispensaries, vaporizers are sold. The concept is the same with the electronic cigarette. Now, when these were originally developed, they were developed as a smoking cessation device, harm reduction. So instead of smoking a cigarette, try an e-cigarette, get off of it. Well, the, the tobacco companies obviously don't want it as a cessation device. They want to hook a whole new, um, addict a whole new generation of young smokers, and that's what their aim is. So e-cigarettes is going to be a looming issue. And I'm sure all your kids have heard of e-cigarettes um, widely advertised now. Um, I want to now get to the prescription drugs. This is for non-medical purposes. We know that prescription drugs are often used by adolescents. Um, and it may be their own prescription. So for example, they're on Ritalin for ADHD, but they're actually using it to, for fun or recreational purposes. Or they're using their parents' medication. Uh, a common one would be opioids, painkillers are the most commonly abused prescription drugs for non-medical purposes among adolescents. When, when adolescents are asked, where do you get these medications from, the most common answer uh, is from their parents or their uh, siblings. Now, it's not necessarily that their parents are handing it to them, but it's in the medicine cabinet. So it's the parents' prescriptions that the kids are using. And friends are also a common source of prescription medications to use for non-medical purposes. It is very rare that a, a, a teen will get it from a, quote, drug dealer who they don't know. Let's switch back to eating disorders here. This is, again, from the Youth Risk Behavior Survey in 2011. Disordered eating behaviors are pretty common, and, and these are all of, all of concern because people don't try, kids don't try these behaviors to, be, to become eating disordered or developing an eating, eating disorder, but it can be like drug use where it can kind of creep up insidiously until the kid really has a big problem. I'm using kids synonymously with teens and adolescents. <laughs> Almost half of high school students had tried to lose weight. Girls more than boys, as you can see, double girls to boys. Um, over one in 10 had fasted to lose weight. Um, taking pills was not that common, but still did occur, as was vomiting to lose weight. And the latest obesity rates on the other end were that 17% of children and adolescents currently in this country um, are diagnosed with obesity. What about mood? If you look at a variety of mental health disorders, one in five adolescents are diagnosed at some point with one of these mood disorders, whether it's depression or anxiety. And depression and anxiety are now believed to be this kind of a similar disorder on a continuum. You can have both, you can have one or the other, but they seem to be related in a significant way. Um, if uh, two-thirds of youth in the juvenile justice system have a mental health disorder that's been diagnosed, depending upon the population that's looked at, um, 20 to 30 percent of adolescents will have one major depressive episode during their adolescence. Suicidality is a problem. Um, anywhere from a half million to a million attempts per year in teens and young adults. Um, and sadly, some of these attempts are successful uh, in, in resulting in death. What about safety? In the United States, there are 35,000 fatal motor vehicle accidents a year. 15,000 of those involve adolescents. And 70% of those are due to adolescents driving under the influence 
or being a passenger with a driver being under the influence of alcohol or drugs. From my point of view, the single most important message we can ever give to our teenagers is don't drive under the influence or don't drive as a passenger with anyone who is under the influence. That's, if there's one message you get from tonight, that would be a key one. Now, I want to go to a summary of adolescent development for you. We in adolescent medicine divide adolescence into three phases, early, middle, and late. Early adolescence is around the ages of 10 to 13. The ages I'm giving you are average. And as an adolescent medicine physician, my age range on average is 10 to 25. Why 10? Well, 10 is the average age of the onset of puberty now. In girls, boys tend to lag behind about a year, but this is the average age of onset of puberty. Menarche, the onset of menses in girls, the average age is now between 12 and 13. Now that's nearing the end of pubertal development. Once you start, you, you have a few years, typically, of puberty, and then it's over. So if you start at 10, you're pretty much done with puberty around 13. And this is a big issue for adolescents, obviously, at this age. Their body is changing. They're wondering what's going on. Am I normal is a big question. They're comparing themselves to, the, to their peers. We have what we call on-time developers, which if you take 100 adolescents, 60% will be on time. 20% will be what we call early developers. So they're going to start puberty earlier. In girls, it can start as young as eight and be normal. Another 20% are going to be what we call late developers, where instead of starting at 10, they may start at 12 or 13. That's all considered normal. So there is this age range of the onset and uh, of puberty and when it ends. But again, on average, it's, uh, it's around 10 where it starts for girls, about a year later for boys. Big issue, puberty, early adolescence. Now, socially, there's some big issues, too, that start occurring. This is the first time when kids really start on their own to expand their social radius beyond their family and kind of start making their own friends a little bit. Before this, you guys are in charge. <laughs> but now kids are starting to do their own thing just a little bit. Just this is just the beginning. I've underlined cognition is usually concrete. <laughs> concrete uh, thinking means that you're really focused on the here and now. It, it means that your own life experience is what reality is. And it's very difficult to take into account other people's life experiences or advice or, or what may be going on. Dealing with a concrete thinker means that when I counsel a teen, I need to really think about short-term outcomes and short-term consequences. A good example would be tobacco use. I can tell a teen, you know, you sh who's starting to experiment with tobacco. You know, this, you could become addicted to this. This could be bad for your health. You could get lung cancer, heart disease. You could die at 60 instead of 70 or 80. Now, all of that is true, but it's meaningless pretty much to a concrete thinker. The things I need to focus on with that teen is, you know what? You smell, you know, I don't like how you smell. You stink. 
you have bad breath, your clothes stink. This is not attractive. Um, it's expensive. Cigarettes are expensive. A pack of cigarettes costs a minimum generally of five bucks, can go more. So if you're developing a habit of smoking, just think that money, and again, short term in a month, instead of spending 20 bucks a week on cigarettes, that's 80 bucks a month. What could you buy for 80 bucks that would be more useful or, for you? Um, and this also gets back to the girl who comes into clinic wondering about her fertility or um, because she's had sex and hasn't gotten pregnant. Her, so her experience is she can't or doesn't need to worry about birth control. Now, our next stage of adolescence is what we call middle. And this is on average ages 14 to 17. As I mentioned, pubertal development is usually complete by this time. Sexual drive emerges. Peer group becomes extremely important. And what peers think and say and do is often more important than what parents uh, would like or, or say and think and do. This is a time that really drives kids crazy plus parents um, because of all this. I would add, though, that in most healthy families, um, ultimately, even though the adolescent may be recalcitrant at times, um, they end up really being more like their parents than they probably would want to admit. Um, but um, it is, the point of this is it is very important who the adolescent's peer group is because the peer group does have big influence on the adolescent. This is a major time of what we call risk-taking behaviors, so sexual activity, drug experimentation, uh, safety issues. Um, I don't want to wear a helmet. I look stupid with a helmet. I don't like wearing a seatbelt. Or on a more positive side, we call it exploratory behaviors. Um, taking, looking, uh, expanding your behavior repertoire, repertoire in a healthy manner. That's what we want to encourage. There are many conflicts over independence. Uh, we in adolescent medicine often call this phase a recapitulation over the ter a recapitulation of the terrible twos. So what does a two-year-old do? Two-year-old, you know, says no. Now an adolescent may not even say anything to you, but but if they say something, it'll probably be no. And they may have a, a two-year-old has a temper tantrum, right? Very common in, in, in two-year-olds. Well, what do you do with a two-year-old that has a temper tantrum? Well, ultimately, if they seem to be out of control, you, you pick them up and you put them in a cage, uh, you know, their pen or whatever, and you, they calm down and that's it. But it's hard to do that with someone who's as big as you or bigger and stronger. Not only that, you don't have to reason with a two-year-old. <laughs> But adolescents are now beginning to develop abstract thinking. And they want to know, well, why are you saying this? What's your reasoning behind it? Uh, you can't just say, because I said so. You can do that to a two-year-old, but not to a 15-year-old. Doesn't make sense to them, and ultimately, it's not going to go very far. Um, and this abstract thinking also takes into account what your words versus your behaviors as parents. So if you're um, using drugs, and I, I have patients with parents who use drugs regularly, that's a role modeling thing that they're going to see. And if you say, well, you shouldn't use drugs, they're not good for you for this reason and that reason, but they see you using drugs or drinking heavily or smoking or whatever it would be, your actions are going to speak louder than your words. And so role modeling as parents is really critical at this time in terms of how you want your adolescence to be. Now, 
The final stage of adolescent development, the third stage we call late adolescence, or the synonymous term that we use is young adult. Now, at this point, certainly physical maturation is complete even for late developers at, at the beginning of this. Um, and this is a time actually of more idealism. It's often a, a time of more reintegration with the family after that middle adolescence, sometimes difficult period. Abstract thinking has certainly developed by this time. Career role begins to be defined and other kind of, how is my life going to be as an adult? Um, we call this whole developmental task of adolescence identity formation. And a healthy identity formation means that you're going to be a healthy, productive adult. Now, there are many aspects to identity that we all have. We have a career identity. We have a social identity. We have a sexual identity, a moral identity, and so on. So this is a complicated process. The good news is most adolescents navigate this well, ultimately. They do well. Thanks to you all. Um, and with, so, but I think it's important to understand these different phases of adolescent development and know what, how the adolescent is approaching it and what they're thinking about. And of course, in our counseling adolescents, we very much take these into account. For an abstract thinker, we can counsel them much differently than a concrete thinker. We can talk about other things and talk about long-term consequences and outcomes and so on, as an example. Now, I want to let you know about adolescent brain development. There's been a lot of research that has gone on in this arena in the last decade. It's very exciting. And what has been very interesting is that we now know the brain develops into the mid-20s. Now, our head doesn't keep on getting bigger and bigger, like in the old Star Trek episodes. But we know that the neuronal connections and, and what, what goes on in the brain, and we know from one point of view, because we go from concrete to abstract thinking. But interestingly, different parts of the brain develop at different times. The last part of the brain to develop is what is called the prefrontal cortex. One of the things the prefrontal cortex is responsible for is impulse control. And that makes a lot of sense to me because we often have adolescents who do stupid things knowing they're stupid. <laughs> but on an impulse, they'll do them. And that's uh, once you get into your mid-20s, hopefully, <laughs> most of that is under pretty good control. And you're going to get much more into the exploratory, healthy behaviors instead of the risk-taking ones. Now, what's unhelpful the, for parents to do? Well, one is to be uncomfortable or embarrassed talking about sex and not acknowledging it. It's fine if you feel uncomfortable about it, or fine if you're embarrassed, but if you don't acknowledge it, your kid's going to pick up on it anyway. And it's not going to work well for the kid, because the teen is going to think, well, I can't talk to my parents about sex. This, this just isn't working. Or they may get the impression that sex is dirty or shameful. They're still going to have sex, by the way. But from a psychosocial point of view, it's going to be potentially problematic. If you can't turn to your parents, well, then who do you turn to? As I just mentioned in adolescent development um, phases, you turn to your peers. Because it's that middle adolescent phase when you're really starting to get interested in sex. And that's when the peer group really comes into major play. Well, peers may not know much, but think they do. And they often, there's a lot of misinformation around this. Or, um, in addition, 
The team gets lots of information about this topic from television, movies, and the media, the internet, YouTube, etc. And much of this is, is not useful or helpful information for the teens. So you all have a very important role to play in helping your teens have a, a healthy sexual, uh, uh, sexuality and approach to sexuality. Or the parent says, uh, the birds and the bees talk. <laughs> Typically, it's when the kid is already um, in the midst of development and already dating or having sex, and it's a one-time thing. And facts alone are necessary, but they're not sufficient for adolescents. They really do want to know what you think about these issues and why you think the way you do. Just giving the facts is really not enough for adolescents. You, you are important to your teens. Again, they may yell and scream and have temper tantrums and all that. But like the two-year-old that has a temper tantrum and is kind of running away, but then looks at, over the side to make sure you're watching, the teen is doing the same thing. They want to be sure you're paying attention. They actually want limits set. They may protest when you set limits. What they want is a menu of choices within limits. Interestingly, in terms of parenting, there's three types of parenting that are, that are, uh, are generally acknowledged. One is called permissive. And this is a parent who says to the teen, well, you're, you're growing up. It's up to you. You make your decisions. That kind of parenting usually does not work the best. The other end is what we call authoritarian parenting. This is the parent who says, you know what? As long as you're in my house, you do what I say. Doesn't matter. I'm in charge. You don't get to make the decisions. It's up to me. That kind of parenting has also been shown to not be as helpful as the third kind of parenting, which is, which is called authoritative. Authoritative parenting recognizes that as teens develop, you can give them more leeway. You can let them make more decisions, but still within the, the limits that you feel are safe and appropriate. But they get to make some decisions, but you set the limits for that. And that kind of parenting has been shown to be the most effective. So not just facts. Facts are important, but also context and, uh, and what you think and why. Now, it, is, it has been shown that typically girls prefer sex discussions with their moms, feel more comfortable with that, and boys with their fathers, although it's also been shown that mothers discussing how girls are to sons and fathers discussing how boys are with daughters is helpful. So I would encourage you all to do that because that, that combination can be the most effective in dealing with sex in your teens. So what's helpful? Well, discussing sex in conjunction with your values, as I mentioned, that it's an expression of love, <laughs> that it should be in the context of a meaningful relationship. What are your lifetime goals? How does sex fit into that and sexuality? Be respectful. What does that mean between partners being respectful to each other? And what are the emotional aspects of sexuality? These are also important to talk about with your kids. And what's safe? What, how we approach it, what our family thinks. If you have a specific faith tradition, it's certainly fine to bring that up. This is our religious or spiritual belief that we feel is important. And how to handle peer pressure, because there is going to be a lot of peer pressure around becoming sexually active um, when you may not want to be. Now, interestingly, religiosity in and of itself is generally not an influence on whether someone becomes sexually active or not. But 
it does help the teen figure out their sexual values around that. Discussion of birth control does not encourage sexual activity. Interestingly, there have been studies that have been done to look at um, groups of, of adolescents where birth control is discussed or not, and the rates of sexual activity are the same. But what's different is that when birth control is discussed, uh, the adolescents use contraception at higher rates, so there's less unintended pregnancy, and they have lower STI rates. Now, is a abstinence is perfectly fine. We definitely believe that no one should have sex until they're really ready. And again, there's a lot of pressure out there to be sexually active before you are ready as a teen. And again, the media is, it promotes this in many ways. Um, but abstinence education alone has been shown to not be that helpful. Again, sexual activity rates are about the same, but higher unintended pregnancy rates and higher STD rates in abstinence-only situations. Now, risk factors do tend to run together. Risk-taking behaviors tend to go together. So as an example, if you use tobacco as a teen, you're more likely to have had sex and to have had it at a younger age. Um, and I mentioned this before, but I think it's important to mention again that they look at your actions. If you engage in risky behaviors or not take care of your health, they're more likely to engage in risky behaviors, including becoming sexually active. Now, there's this study called the National Longitudinal Study of Adolescent Health that has now been going on for a couple of decades. And they came up with some general guidelines for parents that are what we call protective factors for positive health outcomes. And I've listed here some of the top protective health factors. I think they're pretty basic and pretty simple, but unfortunately, sometimes they're neglected. Part, not, not intentionally, necessarily, but we're all busy. We all got a lot going on. <laughs> sometimes it's just hard to do these things, but they really do work. The number one thing was having meals together. Sitting down with your kid, <laughs> talking about the day, Having family time on a regular basis has been shown to be a big protective factor. Now, sometimes kids don't like this. They'll tell you, I don't want to hang out with you for dinner or you know, spend hours with, with this. Or they'll want to be on their cell phone or their laptop or watching TV or whatever. And the whole idea is that none of that's there. And by the way, the parents, too not constantly checking your cell phone during dinner. And by the way, it doesn't have to be every night. But the more frequent, the better, and certainly at least having one or two nights a week where you have a family time together, that's been shown to be very protective. Knowing where your teens are, not just assuming things about where they're going to be, but explicitly asking them where they're going to be, who they're going to be with, and importantly, knowing your teen's friend's parents. Because unless you really know the parents, you may not really get the real scoop on what's going on. And they may tell you one thing, and it's really another thing. So meeting your teen's friend's parents can be really a protective factor. So these four things listed here have been shown to be protective. Others have been shown to be listening to the teen, encouraging um, higher educational aspirations. Uh, uh, having a teen involved in organized activities has been shown to be a good protective factor, whatever it would be. Volunteering somewhere or involved in a youth group or a club or some sport has been shown to be a very healthy uh, opinion, uh, uh, protective factor. And finally, telling your kids what you do think. They may pretend to not listen, 
and they may ignore you even. Um, but somewhere, if, if you consistently state your opinion, it's helpful to them to navigate these developmental tasks of adolescence. So you want to bring up all these topics early. Don't wait till there's a problem. It's, that's sort of getting behind the eight ball. Be open with your teen. Let them know. Um, and uh, this is a common scenario. A teen will go to a party and get drunk. You saw the statistics earlier on this. Now, if you've said to your teen, look, I don't want you getting drunk. I don't want you even drinking, you might even say. OK. But what's been shown to be helpful is to say, you can always call me. OK. I'll be upset. OK. Let's be real here, because you're doing something that could be dangerous, and I don't want you to do it. But you can always call me. I'll make sure you get home safely. But if they feel like they can't call you, they're going to take the risk then of driving under the influence or driving with someone is and being one of these statistics of the 35,000 deaths in this country. Rather than have the talk about all these topics, it's much better to just talk about it as they come up. And inevitably, all these topics are going to come up. There, it's going to be in magazines they read or movies they see or that you see. And you can initiate discussion to say, hey, you know what I saw this show on TV or what I read about this? What do you think? Or I thought this was interesting. In a very non judgmental, but that's the kind of ca more casual, useful way to bring up these topics. And again, to discuss these behaviors in the context of, of your family's values is important. Discussions that are developmentally appropriate, you're not going to talk about long-term consequences of behaviors with the 13-year-old necessarily. You need to be good role models and to strive for those protective factors that I listed. I've, uh, finally, there are a number of resources here. All these websites and agencies that I've listed have lots of uh, have specific information for parents and also many of them for adolescents themselves so that they can look for their stuff, you can look for yours. They're all good. Um, I'm going to end with that. And again, thank you for coming, and I will take any, question, <clears throat> take any questions you may have.